Lijep pozdrav iz Sarajevskog studija. Ja sam Ika Ferrer Gotić. Ovo je specijalna emisija N1 televizije. Tačno je godinu dana od jedne od najvećih nuklearnih eksplozije u modernoj historiji. Ona je koja se je dogodila 4. augusta u centru Bejruta. Dvije eksplozije uništile su veći dio grada, poginulo je više od 200 osoba, a više od 6.000 ljudi je ranjeno. 300.000 ljudi je raseljeno. Tog 4. augusta 2020. godine eksplodirala je velika količina amonijevog nitrata u skladište na uluci Bejruta, glavnog grada Libana. Teret od 2.750 tona substance, što je ekvivalentno oko 1,1 kiloton TNT-a, bio je uskladišten bez odgovarajućih sigurnosnih mjera prethodnih 6 do 7 čak godina, nakon što su ga libanske vlasti zaplijenile sa napuštenog broda MV Roses. Još uvijek se istražuje uzrok ove eksplozije. Stotine hiljada djece i dalje pati od gladi u Libanu nakon prošlogodišnje razorne eksplozije i decenijama duge ekonomske krize u zemlji, navode to izveštaj ljudskih prava Ujedinjenih nacija. Organizacija Save the Children upozorava na sve veći broj djece koja traže hranu po ulicama, po kontejnerima nezbrinuta i prepuštena samoj sebi. Migranska kriza također sve teže pada na ovu zemlju. CNN-ov reporter Ben Wiedemann našao se u Bejrutu za vrijeme ove eksplozije. Ben je večeras i naš gost i večeras Večeras tražimo odgovore o odgovornosti za eksploziju, ekonomsku krizu i sve veće siromaštvo. No prije toga, ovo je izvještaj Bena Videmana 2020. godine. George Faroun has come with a friend to see what they can salvage from the remains of his parents' apartment, which looked directly onto Beirut's port. Tuesday's blast turned it into a moonscape, a panorama of utter destruction. Dried blood marks the spot where his mother was resting in bed when the explosion sent a wall slamming on top of her. She's still in hospital. This was his parents' retirement home. This is their, their life, everything they did here. Look what happened. Given the damage, they probably will never be able to move back. Many neighbors were badly injured, others killed. In addition to the dead and the wounded, many, many people have lost their homes. According to the governor of Beirut, more than 300,000 people in the city have been made homeless. People are packing up and moving out. While others try to salvage what they can, the area near the port is now a hive of activity as an army of volunteers like Maggie Demergian has launched into a massive cleanup effort, perhaps to show themselves that despite this country's mountain of woes, good will prevail. Lebanese people doesn't deserve this. Yeah, we are good people. They've come from all over the city, handing out food and water, pitching in wherever, however they can. Officials believe the blast emanated from a warehouse filled with 2,750 metric tons of ammonium nitrate, sitting there under lax security for six years. The government has promised a quick, transparent investigation. Yet going back decades, Lebanon has witnessed a series of high-profile assassinations and rarely, if ever, has the truth emerged. This, this accident here, this crisis, for 20 years we're going to talk about the investigation. is never going to end. No conclusion, no results. And no confidence among many here that the truth will ever be known. As the first anniversary of the deadly Beirut explosion approaches, life has only become more unbearable for millions of Lebanese people who have seen their living conditions deteriorate, forcing some of them even to leave the country. And tonight we are bringing CNN's correspondent, Emmy Award winner, Ben Wiedemann. Ben is joining us from Beirut. Ben, welcome to the program and thank you for joining. My pleasure. Ben, it's one year 
since the Beirut explosion, Beirut blast. What is the situation on the ground today, one year later? Is Beirut recovering? What does it look like today? Beirut is recovering, but not sort of in a general sense. Uh, those areas that were most affected by the 4th August blast, there has been some rebuilding. Uh, businesses are starting to get up and running, but this is largely the result of individual initiatives or help through non-governmental organizations, the money coming from abroad. What is significant is that uh, foreign countries are are unwilling to channel assistance through the Lebanese government for fear that the money will be simply siphoned off through corruption, and therefore the progress in rebuilding has been slow. And it's important to keep in mind that the blast happened at a time when the Lebanese economy is collapsing. Uh, the local currency, the lira, which two years ago was worth a thousand five hundred dollars, uh, rather a thousand five hundred lira to the dollar, is now worth. 20,000 lira to the dollar. In other words, it's lost more than 90 percent of its value. You have hyperinflation. You have a collapse of basic public services like electricity. Here in Beirut, for instance, if you're lucky, you get four hours of electricity a day. Frequently, there are long lines for petrol. There are shortages of baby formula. Medicines, for instance, many Lebanese who have relatives who are visiting from overseas will ask them to bring medicine in. So the blast is really just one part of a series of disasters that Beirut and Lebanon in general are suffering from, Ika. Suffering. And you're standing in the place where I stood just a couple of months before the blast. And uh, I've learned a lot about Lebanon and Beirut itself, such a beautiful city. Uh, but as you said, Lebanese decade-long economic struggle has now been some quite some time in the Middle Eastern focus, world focus. And you said that, that there is a setback after the blast when it comes to Lebanon regarding uh, the, the economy. Uh, how much of that setback is to be seen er in everyday life? Now, we know that the human cost of the economic and political crisis in Lebanon is causing one third of Lebanese children to go to bed hungry, and most households are short on food and, as you said, medicine. Yeah, in fact, what we've seen is in the last two years, 50 percent of the population now lives below the poverty line. Keep in mind that until a few years ago, Lebanon had the highest per capita income outside of the oil producing uh, countries among the era in the Arab world. And what you've seen is a dramatic fall in the quality of life for most Lebanese. Uh, there's massive unemployment. Businesses are closing uh, left and right. Uh, there's a brain drain, keeping in mind, of course, that Lebanon has one of the highest literacy rates in the Arab world, a very skilled, well-educated workforce. But increasingly, young people can't find work. They have to go overseas to find opportunities. So in addition to, as I said, power cuts most of the day and shortages of all the things that, for instance, where you are and elsewhere outside, people take for granted. Here, for instance, if I get six hours of power a day, I'm delighted. And uh, this is true for everybody here except a tiny elite who have money, who have power, who have who don't lack for anything. And th those are the politicians who are the focus of so much anger here because it is their policies, their mismanagement of the economy, their corruption, their inability to rebuild this country after the civil war that ended in 1990 is what has gotten this country into the multiple crises it is in today. Ben, this, this reminds me a lot uh, of Bosnia as well. When it comes to 
decades long mismanagement of the politicians and uh, who the elite is and how people actually live. I would like to focus a little bit more on the children now. Now the organization Save the Children has found in their newest reports that the gap in finances for families for basic survival has increased significantly after the blast. Now the report said children are going hungry after the blast. Let's discuss this now more in detail. Now it's 12 months after the blast. The whole country has been through, uh, uh, brought to its knees with more than half of the population living in poverty, like you said. Uh, what do we need to know? What do you really see on the streets? What do you see in your reports? What should we all be more aware of when it comes to basic needs of the Lebanese people? And do you think the world is turning the blind eye to the Lebanese suffering? The world has turned a blind eye uh, to Lebanese suffering. Keep in mind that this is a country that hosts more than one million Syrian refugees uh, since the war broke out there in March of 2011. And this is a country with a population of perhaps six million people. In other words, one in seven people in this country are refugees. And the Lebanese government, the Lebanese sort of the economy in general, has tried to accommodate uh, them. But but uh, by and large, nobody seems to understand the scale of the burden that the Syrian refugees put on Lebanon and its economy and its public services. Now, talking about the plight of Lebanese children, I've lived here for the last four years, but I've been coming and going for decades. The first time I was here, I was living here in the 1970s. And what you see now that you never see, saw before are people, including children, who are going through the garbage, looking for food, looking for plastic bottles, metal cans that they can resell. This is something you never see before. Increasingly, you see children working at garages, children you know, 9, 10 years old, uh, because their families desperately need work. Increasingly, you see lots of street children. Uh, I was walking through uh, another part of town on my way home at about 11.30 the other night, and I was shocked at the number of children who were out on the street, clearly had nowhere to go. And so these are things that we never saw before here, certainly not since the end of the Civil War in 1990, is that in this country that many people assume is prosperous, increasingly you see that uh, poverty is on the rise, in particular poverty that affects children. Ika? And now especially with the pandemic, um, how does Lebanon, the Lebanese government, deal, well, government, how, how do people deal with the pandemic, with the coronavirus, shortage of uh, vaccines, uh, what is the situation right now, especially now when we have even more burden on the society, which is COVID-19? Well, we've heard from hospital directors here uh, that they are struggling, that they're struggling with the fact that they don't have enough money to pay for diesel to fuel their generators, which are sometimes on for 22 hours a day because there is no municipal power, power provided uh, by the state. They are suffering from a shortage of oxygen, from a sore shortage of medicine, and there's a brain drain of Lebanese doctors and nurses who, because of the, the purchasing power of their salaries has almost evaporated, many of them are looking for work overseas. Now, the government is encouraging Lebanese and others to come and visit Lebanon because the country needs hard cash. Unfortunately, this influx of people from abroad is bringing in more cases of COVID, and therefore the numbers are increasing. Now, having said all of those fairly gloomy things, I have to say that the government-run vaccination program has been very successful because of help from the international community, and therefore it is not too difficult to get vaccinated here. So there's one bit of positive news among all these gloomy things I've been telling you, Ika. Definitely. That is good to hear. At least that 
uh, is a positive news. Uh, I want to go back to the refugees. There are over two million only Syrian refugees in, in Lebanon. Uh, how does Lebanon, especially Beirut, uh, deal with refugees from Syria? And you've been, been to Syria as well. You've been to Gaza. You know the situation. You know uh, the population that is in Beirut, in Lebanon now, uh, mostly ch wounded children, mothers and, and families. How do they deal with with such a uh, refugee influx, the, the, the increase of refugees in, in uh, Lebanon, in Beirut? And how has the blast affected this particular social group? Well, the blast took place in an area where there were some Syrian workers, some Syrian families, uh, but the refugees are, are concentrated more outside of Beirut, and the Palestinian refugees in a part of the town of Beirut further away. So they weren't quite as affected uh, as the Lebanese population in general. As far as how Lebanon is dealing with the refugees, of course, now the government is trying to encourage Syrians to go home. This against the advice of the United Nations, which says they should not go home because Syria is not safe and the refugees themselves <coughs> excuse me, are putting their lives at risk because of possible retaliation uh, by the Syrian uh, regime. But nonetheless, we're also seeing some Syrians are actually going back to Syria because of the dire economic situation here. Uh, Syrian refugees never had it easy here, uh, but as the economy collapses, they are finding increasingly it's almost impossible uh, to find work, to make a living, to feed their families. So many of them are looking either to return to Syria despite the risks or trying to leave by sea to go to Cyprus, hoping to eventually get to Europe. But that itself is very dangerous. But many of them feel as if their backs are against the walls. Ika? Wow. Uh, well, refugees seem not to be uh, given many choices um, to... <laughs> to actually choose from what is the best for their life and, and taking in consideration the migrant route which goes through Bosnia through where we are right now. We have seen in what conditions refugees are and uh, it, it's not recommendable at all uh, to take that path either. Okay, Ben, let's go back to the blast itself. Uh, we all know how it happened. Uh, what is the a final aftermath, the casualties, the injured, uh, hospitals and rubbles, a health system. What do we know now? How and who is responsible for the blast one year later? Well, that's the question everybody here is asking. There has been an investigation. There is an investigation ongoing uh, into the blast run by the Lebanese authorities, but it's an investigation which a year later really has come up with no information. Interestingly enough, just the day after the blast, on the 5th of August, the interior minister of Lebanon, Mohammed Fahmi, said within five days we will come up with the cause of the blast and who is to blame. Well, here we are almost a year later. Nobody has been properly charged. Uh, there was a judge who was appointed to lead the investigation, but uh, he was dismissed after he asked to prosecute certain senior politicians. They launched a counter case in the courts claiming that the judge was not impartial because his house was damaged in the blast. Another judge was appointed. Among other things, he wanted to question the powerful head of public security. His request was turned down. The families of the victims were very angry. They protested and clashed with guards outside the interior minister's house. And the feeling is that the politicians in general, the political elite, are joining together to try to prevent the investigation for, from finding out what exactly happened. Why was there 
2,750 metric tons of very explosive ammonium nitrate in the port of Beirut. Were there even 2,750 tons? Were they smuggled out, as a recent FBI report suggests? Uh, were, were they smuggled to Syria? Were they being used by the regime there to make barrel bombs? There are so many questions and so few of those questions. In fact, categorically, I'll say none of those questions have been answered. And increasingly, there is real anger here in Lebanon focused on the political elite who most people feel are trying to hide something, lots of things, from the public about the blast. Ika? As it seems, will the government then, from what you see, what you are telling us, ever take the accountability uh, for, for the blast and for the life lost and for the injuries and from, for deteriorating economy, which is a constant uh, issue in Lebanon? Yeah, the feeling is, Ika, that the political elite has utterly failed uh, this country. It has failed to rebuild out of, after the civil war. It has failed to provide the most basic of public services. It has stolen billions of billions of dollars that were given to Lebanon to rebuild after the war. Specifically, as far as the port goes, the, there was a fire in the port, and the port is right next to heavily populated parts of Beirut. There was no attempt to tell the population to leave. And so the port, the warehouse hangar number 12, burned for perhaps 40 minutes before the blast, and there was no action by the authorities to evacuate the population in that area. After the blast, I was in those the CNN crew was in those most affected areas. The government was totally absent in trying to provide basic assistance to the victims of the blast, to try to provide them with food and water and medical care. It was really individual Lebanese and social groups, non-governmental organizations who came to the rescue of the population of Beirut after the blast. The government simply wasn't there. All we saw of the government was policemen sitting around eating food that was intended to be given out to the victims of the blast, uh, drinking the water that was being handed out by volunteers, sitting on chairs, smoking cigarettes, looking at their telephones. There was a negligible government response to this blast, and that was just a microcosm of the general picture of inaction, incompetence, mismanagement, and corruption of Lebanon's political elite when it comes to addressing the most basic needs of the citizens of Lebanon. Ika? We saw all, we all saw the pictures that came out of Beirut when blast happened. It was quite biblical, of bi biblical proportions. It is unimaginable that the government could just sit back and watch and being served like that, it, it is unimaginable. People of Lebanon, people of Beirut have deserved so much better. Uh, it is a divided society. What is next for Beirut? What is next for Lebanon, uh, Ben? And why this country really deserves more international attention and definitely more help? It definitely needs more help, and perhaps help could be coming. Uh, the European Union, the United States, have made it clear that they are not going to provide any assistance to Lebanon, to the Lebanese government, that is, uh, until there is a proper Lebanese government, because the Lebanese government of our current prime minister, who's a caretaker prime minister, they that government resigned on the 10th of August last year, and since then, Lebanon has had a caretaker government, which has very limited executive abilities to implement the kind of reforms that the European Union and the United States have made clear are prerequisites 
for the aid. Lebanon has to fight corruption. It has not. The government has not fought corruption. The government is corruption. Lebanon has not implemented basic reforms to bring things like electricity and drinkable running water to the population. Until the international community is confident Lebanon will do that, can do that, then the aid will flow. Then perhaps things will improve. But there's no sign at this point that the politicians are willing to do that. On the 31st of, or rather the 30th of July this year, the European Union announced that it had worked out a framework to impose sanctions on Lebanese politicians who have stood in the way in the formation of a government, who have engaged in corrupt practices. Those sanctions include the seizure of assets in Europe of those politicians who have not been named. They include a travel ban for Lebanon's political elite to Europe. And let's keep in mind, Lebanon's political elite are some very rich people. For instance, the current designate prime minister, the man who's been given the task of forming a government, according to Forbes Middle East, his personal wealth is worth $2.5 billion. His personal wealth increased in 2021 by $400 million. These are people who have lots of money, and if the EU and the United States threatens to seize their assets, perhaps, finally, they will take action, not for themselves, as they are very good at, but rather for the benefit of the people of Lebanon. But we shall see if these people can change their very old habits. Well, it's perplexed that you uh, need to be sanctioned uh, in order to do your job and do something for what you sit there for, uh, the, the public service, something for the people. And if that's the way to do it, so be it. Uh, ben, one personal question, if I may. Uh, you said you've been coming back to Beirut, to Lebanon, ever since 1970. Uh, what keeps you in Lebanon? And I see you are very, very passionate uh, about Lebanon yourself. Well, Lebanon is the country where I first started to learn Arabic. I was just 14 years old at a boarding school here. And I, I've been coming back ever since. And it's a country that it's tiny by most standards, perhaps six, seven million people if you uh, count the refugees. But it is rich in history, rich in culture, rich in art. Uh, and it's got a population that is amazingly sophisticated, uh, a population that through the millennia has traveled the world and come back and brought sort of everything from the world uh, back to it. And, and so you will find most Lebanese are fluent in more than one, say, are fluent in several uh, languages, are familiar. They're, they're very well informed. They follow the news like almost nobody because oftentimes the news will affect them. So, and it's a country really at the heart of the Middle East. We have Israel, Palestine to the south, Syria to the east, Turkey to the north, and we are at the far, the eastern end of the Mediterranean. You really are at the center of the world here in Beirut, here in Lebanon. Ika? That's so beautifully said. Ben, I would like to thank you for taking time to speak with us. Uh, thank you so much. It's been quite an honor. And of course, stay safe. Thank you, Ika. Thank you. This was CNN's correspondent, Emmy Award winner Ben Wiedemann. Ben was joining us from Beirut, Lebanon. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
Dobrodošli nazad. Ovo je specijal o eksploziji u Bejrutu koja se dogodila na današnji dan 2020. godine. Na YouTube kanalu objavljena je snimka eksplozije u Bejrutu koja je snimljena iz nevjerovatne blizine. Ovo je snimak koji jasno pokazuje nivo uništenja koje je prouzrokovala upravo ova eksplozija. Osoba koja je snimala ovaj video i sama je pretrpjela povrede od eksplozije. Libanski sigurnosni dužnostnici ranije su upozoravali premijera i predsjednika da 2750 tona amonijevog nitrata pohranjenih u Luci u Bejrutu predstavlja sigurnosni rizik i može uništiti glavni grad u slučaju eksplozije, doznaje to Reuters. Pa nešto više od dvije sedmice poslije tog 4. augusta eksplozija se izgleda. I dogodila. U njoj je poginulo, kao što smo rekli, više od 200 ljudi. Više od 6.000 stanovnika je ozljeđeno. Domove je izgubilo više od 300.000 ljudi. Ukupna šteta procijenjuje se na oko 15 milijardi američkih dolara. I sami građani su snimali kako je to izgledalo poslije ove eksplozije. Upozoravamo na uznemirujuće snimke.
خمسة ستة ثمانية تسعة واحد اثنين خمسة ستة ثمانية تسعة Satelitski snimci i oni reporterski pokazuju razmire štete nastale u eksplozijama u glavnom gradu Libana, Bejrutu, a zgrade kilometrima od luke su u ruševinama. Eksplozija dolazi u strašno vrijeme za Liban koji je na rubu finansijskog kolapsa. U Libanu raste bijesti danas zbog industrijske nesreće koje su vlasti predviđale i upozoravale godinama unaprijed. Libanska vlada još uvijek vodi istragu, ali mnogi u zemlji i na međunarodnoj sceni pozivaju na nezavisnu istragu. Što se to tačno dogodilo u Luci rano u večer 4. augusta još uvijek je nejasno, ali nekoliko činjenica izašlo je na vidjelo u danima nakon eksplozije. Sad započinje prije gotovo sedam godina kada je nestabilni brod napustio istočno evropsku državu Đorđiju sa smrtonosnim teretom. U oktobru 2015. 2750 tona amonijevog nitrata na brodu Rousus do sada je smješteno u skladište u Bejrutu, a brod je zadržan u Luci kaže advokati te posade koji su među vremenu i pušteni s plovila. Poslije toga nejasno je zašto je ovaj eksplozivni materijal tako dugo ostao netaknut u Luci u Bejrutu. Oh my god! There was a massive explosion. I mean, something that uh, really shook this city like I've never seen before. And I've been through wars here in Lebanon, I and mean, this is something unheard of. I'm looking at the buildings all around me. All the many windows are also smashed. There's lots of glass and other debris in the street. Izra Seblani pokazivala je svoju vjenčanicu na raskošnom trgu u centru Bejruta tog 4. augusta kada je snažna eksplozija potresla gradsku luku, srušivši zgrade i prekrivši područje dimom. Snimci koje je snimio Seblani je vjenčani fotograf prikazuju trenutak udarnog vala ove eksplozije. Ovo je jedan od najupečatljivijih snimaka ove bejrutske eksplozije. CNN. It was a picture-perfect wedding shoot, the glowing bride posing for photos, a short walk from the luxury wedding venue in downtown Beirut. As a smiling doctor Isra Siblani looks down at her bouquet, horror strikes. Her big day blown away in an instant. The couple and the video crew run for cover, destruction all around them. At that moment, oh, one thing I, I, I thought about, Now I'm losing my life. I'm losing my husband. I'm gonna be buried under a building. Now I'm gonna die. I'm wait. I'm now. I'm waiting the moment. How how I'm gonna die? Is it going to be fast? Am I going to feel it? Am I going to be near him? 29-year-old Sablani, a U.S. resident, came back to her native Lebanon to get married. The original plan was to have the wedding party in the United States. But husband Ahmed Speh says he's been waiting for his U.S. visa for three years. With immigration laws getting stricter by the day under the Trump administration, the couple says they didn't want to be apart any longer and finally settled on celebrating their marriage in Beirut with friends and family in the city where their love first blossomed. At that moment, the beautiful place I was in, uh, where the people were dining in the restaurant, shopping, uh, walking, 
it turned out into a ghost town, filled with dust, shattered glasses, um, people yelling, bleeding. It was a nightmare. Siblani did a final run through of the bridal suite where she and Speh would yeah. spend the night after the party. Oh, very nice. Uwe and eyeing it over the flourishes. When the couple returned, the red rose petals thrown off the bed were all that remained of the romance they'd envisioned. Because we are alive, we can't continue. And don't be sad or anything. We will continue and we will pass it and we will make it, inshallah. Inshallah. And Isra, this is very emotional for you. I don't know what to tell you, but trust me, there is no word to describe really what I feel, no matter how I talk. In a city where life was turned upside down in seconds, Isra and Ahmed are just grateful to be alive. Jumana Karachi, CNN, Istanbul. Od kolonije do modernog, nijedan drugi bliskoistočni grad nije se pokazao kao središte umjetnosti, mode, kulture, otpornosti, prkosa, ponosa, poput Bejruta. Spoj istoka i zapada, tradicije i modernosti, Libanskoj prijestolnici zaslužio je nadimak Pariz na Bliskom istoku. Iako ovaj grad prolazi kroz najteže vrijeme od kraja rata 1990. upornost stanovnika ovog grada da prežive i ponos u tome viđeni su samo još i u Sarajevu tokom ratnih 90. godina. Ja sam Mika Ferrer-Gotić. Hvala za pašnje.